and what it is you can do or I can do or we both can or can't do. He wouldn't do it. And had he done that, had he leveled with the American people, had he been honest with them, he'd been reelected president, no question of it. I knew the man too well, and while I relished the chance to run against Jack Kennedy, we'd even talked about using the same airplane and doing it the old-fashioned way, get out on the stump and debate. But with Lyndon, I knew he'd throw everything at me but the old dog, and he did. Some of the tactics he used have gone down in presidential campaign history as the worst that have ever been used. But I never held it too much against him. It, we knew we couldn't get elected, but we wanted, chiefly, I wanted to get control of the Republican Party away from the eastern seaboard, as I call it, and we did that. And indeed, uh, that's what Barry Goldwater did for the Republican Party uh, uh, to his lasting credit. He kind of took the Republican Party uh, out of the uh, supper clubs and athletic clubs and universities of uh, New York and Massachusetts and made it, remade it into a national party. Uh, he, Barry is a populist uh, in his uh, own way. Conservative, yes, but uh, he understood and, and, and has always understood that the Republican Party uh, is not, a, not an Eastern country club. Uh, and he really sort of, uh, in that fight with Nelson Rockefeller, uh, took the party away from uh, the Eastern establishment and planted its roots uh, all over the United States of America. The fight with Nelson Rockefeller that Goldwater waged in 1964 is somewhat historic in political war games. Rockefeller controlled the East, plus the moderate and liberal wings of the party. Goldwater got the nomination, but he still didn't have the votes of the Rockefeller faction. He decided to face the issue head on, flying into Albany, New York in the heat of the 64 campaign. Sorry we're late. Just glad you're here. Thank you. Oh, we are so sorry. It had snow and we were not there. Senator! 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 I you to get together and support the candidates who have been nominated by the Republican Party. Now, I'll say what I've said time and again. You might disagree with him a little bit, but would you disagree with Bob Kennedy or Ken Keating the most? And you know what the answer would be. You need Keating, you need Meter, you need the men who have been nominated, the women who have been nominated, and please, please, in this great state of New York, the second biggest Republican state in the nation, please don't buy your foolishness of staying divided. Deny yourselves candidates' elections that are needed, and please, and this is a personal matter, help Bill Miller and I become president and vice president of this country so we can help you. And what about the, the talk of a disagreement between you and Governor Rockefeller and uh, wounds that haven't healed? I don't know of any uh, argument that uh, Nelson and I have. Uh, I think one of the healthiest things about the Republican Party is that we can have different interpretations of the Republican Party's philosophy. He's backed me right from the start. I've backed him right from the start. We got a broad, that's a broad spectrum of thinking in our party to represent the American people. What about Senator Keating supporting you, Senator? Uh, that's, that's Ken's own judgment. I'll back Ken to the hilt and I hope he wins. each other or we must die vote for president johnson on november 3rd the stakes are too high for you to stay home 
Where were you when you first saw those television ads that the Johnson campaign was running against you? Oh, I saw them. And I just said to the staff, I said, well, what did you expect? I said, here's the television ad on my position on Social Security. And all I was trying to do was tell the American people that Social Security was bankrupt. But they had me tearing up a card. And then because in answer to a press question up in, uh, in Connecticut relative to atomic weapons, I said that, uh, that the commander of NATO had authority to use it. Well, they made a big hoorah about that, and later on, Time magazine had to admit that he did have that authority. But that's when they had the girl picking the daisies, and boom, and the whole world blows up. I just said that's what we had to expect when we ran. That the ad, when I saw it for the first time, that nuclear bomb, I thought it was so grossly unfair and inappropriate, and I, I was one of those who, when I saw it, I called up and said, you should get it off the air, this is terrible. My own team put together a couple of movies. One of them was pretty funny, so we used it. The other one was so terrible, I saw it, previewed it in Philadelphia, and I said, don't ever show this picture. It was downright dirty, and it's never been shown. I think I've seen it once. I don't even know where a copy of it is today. <laughs> I tried to be nice with him and decent with him, but uh, he didn't play ball that way. I, I, mm. I knew I couldn't win. The day I was writing my acceptance speech, I'm looking over in the corner at the Princeton Research and had a flip chart showing me 20 and Johnson 80. And I said, why don't we tear this speech up and write one and tell them to go to hell and get another candidate? <laughs> but no, it was too far along. Uh, it's never caused me any discomfort. Uh, I just, uh, the country didn't want me, so I, the country didn't want me. I went home. After you lost in 64 in the presidential race, you came back and ran for the Senate again in 68. Why? Well, I would never have run unless Carl, Carl Hayden retired, which he did. I would never have run against Carl. I was still a relatively young man. I thought that uh, I had a lot that I could give my state and give my country. I think with hindsight, and seeing it as I see it today, I probably would not have run. Because I, I now, even though I'm on my fifth term, I think the term should be limited to two. But I didn't think that at the time. I do now. And I've also found out that even though I have been in the Senate longer than any Republican, having missed that four-year period I lost all my seniority. So although I'm, from the standpoint of service, the ra highest ranking Republican, it doesn't do me any good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm chairman of a committee I like to be chairman of. I serve on other committees that I like to serve on. I could be chairman of the Commerce Committee, but I didn't want to push Senator Packwood out of the picture, who had worked real hard for it, and I enjoy just as much doing what I'm doing. The loss of seniority uh, uh, would be enough to cause me not to do it again. And my advice to anybody in the same predicament would be don't try it. But Barry Goldwater did try it again in 68. He won and found himself a freshman senator with the minority party in the Senate. But there was a Republican in the White House for the first time in eight years. Goldwater supported Richard Nixon fervently for years. He supported him through much of Watergate, all of it in fact, until the week before the Nixon resignation. I supported Nixon. I worked like the devil for him. 
But when he got in that Watergate mess, and I was the first one to go to him and said, told him, tell the truth, tell what happened, level with the American people and you'll be all right. Well, he didn't do it. And the more it went on and on and on, the madder I got, because the more he lied to the American people. He was lying to you too. Wasn't he it? lied to me, he lied to his family, he lied to everybody. And I remember I was on a television program one morning when he had decided to go to China the very day that Gerald Ford had decided to run for a re-election, a, a, a seek election, and went to New Hampshire. And uh, just in a millisecond, it came to me that this was a dishonest man. And I said so publicly. I got home and my wife just gave me hell. How can you say that about Dick? So I sat her down and told her all the things that came to me so quickly that made me realize that all Dick Nixon was interested in was Richard Milhouse Nixon. He didn't care about the country. He did a pretty good job in foreign policy. But any man that will not be honest with his own family and continue to lie to his own country, I can't stand for. On that TV show, you said, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Nixon, go to China and stay there? Yeah, that's, what, that's the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us about August 5th, 1974, when you were selected to be among a very few number of people that had to go over to the White House and tell Richard Nixon he would never survive a, an impeachment trial in the Senate. The day before, Gerald Ford came to our annual, I mean, our weekly Republican luncheon. And that's when he disclosed to us the fact that he, Nixon had lied again. That was on a Tuesday. Well, I stood up and I asked for the floor and I said, I have taken all I can take. I am publicly going to oppose this man. Well, my fellow Republicans, as they do, they came, they came to me and said, we want you to go to the White House and talk with Nixon. Uh, it seems to me every time there's a problem around here, they call on old Goldie to get somebody <laughs> out of it. So I called the White House and said, I'd like to come up and talk with the president and Dean Birch uh, of Tucson uh, told me, he said, well, let's not be in a hurry. Can we have lunch tomorrow? So I went out to Dean's house and had lunch with he and Alexander Haig. And there they told me the whole story, just where the things sat and the fact that the president was sitting on the tip of a pin or a needle and he could go either way so we didn't want to upset him and have him drag this thing out into a long uh, congressional process. They asked me if I could visit that afternoon with Nixon at the White House. Now, I didn't know at that time they were going to bring John Rhodes or Scott. When I got to the White House, there they were. We went in, sat down, and he sat there. You'd think he just finished a hole in one. He talked with each one of us, talked with me about uh, campaigning and how much we'd campaign together and so forth. And then he finally said, uh, well, what do my chances look like on the Hill? Well, I said, Mr. President, if you have 12 or 13 votes in the Senate, that's more than I think you have. I think you've had it. John Rhodes told him essentially the same thing, and Hugh Scott agreed. That's about as far as it went. We, were, we had agreed that we would not say to him, you have to resign. Although, had it been me alone, I would have told him. We left the office, went outside, and the press were all out there. And we had to be very careful so that we wouldn't infer that he had made up his mind. And I came back down to the Senate and reported to the Senate leadership, the Republican leadership, what had transpired and that I personally felt that he was going to quit. And then later on that 
evening, we were told that he had made up his mind. And the next evening, we were all, the leadership was called to the White House. And I'll never forget it. It was the Oval Room, and uh, uh, he told us he'd made up his mind, and I shed a tear because you never expect to hear a, a president say he's going to quit. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. I don't think there's more than a handful of people who still respect Dick Nixon. You don't. I don't. I have no respect for him at all. He knows it, too. As Richard Nixon got on the helicopter that day and Jerry Ford became president, Goldwater breathed a sigh of relief. Goldwater liked Jerry Ford, but he did not agree with the Nixon pardon. I was over, well, I was out home, and uh, Ford called me without realizing the difference in time and got me out of bed and told me what he'd done. I said, I think you've made a mistake. I said, number one, what has he done that you're going to pardon him for? He hasn't been indicted. He hasn't even been charged. So what are you pardoning him for? Well, I can't remember his exact words. He says, I think God will understand why I did it. I said, well, if he does, he'll be the only one that does because I don't understand it and I think it's wrong. After being on this hill for 30 years or so and dealing with the news media, what do you think of the news media in this country? First, let me say generally across the country, I think the media is pretty good. But when you get down to specifics, now for a while the Washington Post was nothing but a left-wing newspaper. Now they have some conservative writers and columnists the New York Times is completely left-wing. The Boston papers, most all of the big newspapers on the East Coast, uh, except for the South, are extremely liberal. But you get out into the boondocks and the newspapers are pretty fair. I think the television system, uh, the individual stations, you can't find fault with them. But when you get into the networks, that's what I really get my dander up. I ask you what was accomplished by no, this, this briefing today. I'm not going to talk about it. It's highly secret. I'm not going to talk to you about things like that. You know that. What, why did, uh, was there, there no report on what the U.S. did? I'm not going to talk to you about it, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Seriously, Senator, did this make any difference to the prospects for the Pentagon's budget? I'm not going to talk about it, gentlemen. Now, God damn it, it's top secret. Get it through your heads. Barry Goldwater in the Washington News Media. We're going to wrap this up when we come back. Starting a new day on a job site, I try and make sure I've got everything planned out well ahead of time. Dave Austin is a home builder, an Arizonan who believes in doing a job right. I'm not an artist or a painter, but I think I build one heck of a house, and I'm proud of every one I've done. In the end, quality comes down to people and hard work. At Southwest Savings, we think the money Dave saves should work as hard as he does. That's why our retirement accounts are designed to shelter income today while they build security for tomorrow. I've got a certain way I like things done. Since my name goes on the finished product, I want it done right. Doing things right, that's the Southwest way. When a person mentions Barry Goldwater, one thing nearly all agree upon is that he speaks his mind. He does not mince words. Why? Because I say what I think. 
I don't try to... I, I think of something, and I think, now, am I right or wrong? And after reasoning over it for a, a day, if I say, oh, by God, you're right, then I'd say something about it. Now, he has a tendency to shoot from the hip. In other words, he, it doesn't bother him to say what he thinks or feels at a particular instant. Have you either been a victim of that or uh, have had to soothe over feathers because of that? Both. <laughs> <laughs> but it's refreshing, it really is. And you know, an, an element of spontaneity of that sort is sort of also part of what the Senate amounts to. There used to be a joke among the press uh, who followed him in 64. While they could see that he was going to get clobbered and they, they, they liked, the press really liked Barry Goldwater and it was a joy to be assigned to his airplane because Nobody was trying to finesse you or prove uh, something to you or mislead you. But he was always having to clarify his statements. He'd stop in Idaho and make some remark to a bunch of cattlemen or sheepmen. But in the context of Barry Goldwater, it sounded all right in his relationship with those people. But to the Easterners, it was insulting or, or difficult. This one reporter said he had a special key put on his typewriter and he punched it. And the typewriter banged out automatically the following. Uh, Senator Goldwater's aides later explained that what he really meant was... An Far be it from me, or anybody that I know around here, that would tell Barry to knock it off, why did you say that stupid thing? You might say that to yourself, but uh, you don't say it to Barry Goldwater, because uh, as much as you may disagree with him, a lot of people, and I'm one of those people, respect him for his uh, courage to say what he thinks is right at the time, even if it turns out that he's got to change his mind later. He's not sitting there writing out a press release and figuring out how is this going to play back on North Central Avenue or, or South 6th Street in Tucson or Patagonia or Flagstaff. He says it and then, then picks up the pieces if he has to. Senator Barry Goldwater. One of the biggest political surprises Arizona has seen in recent years was Barry Goldwater's decision to run for re-election in 1980. His health was not the greatest. He admits he nearly died from an infection in his leg. I went to the Republican National Convention knowing I had to climb 24 steps and knowing I could make 22 and that's about as far as I could go. And I got up there and it was a silly thing to do. But it was a matter of pride. I figured it was the seventh time I had ever spoken before a Republican organization of that size, and I wanted to do it. But then I came home and I found a beautifully orchestrated campaign against me, professionally done, with a very attractive candidate who could get his points across, and I literally was lucky to win that. Let me ask you a question going back to the decision that you made in January of 1980 to run for that. There was a lot of people in that state that said, what's going on? Uh, he's had a great career. He's uh, got some health problems. He's going to be the greatest elder state statesman this uh, state or this nation has ever seen. Why is he running? Well, I'll tell you, that was a peculiar thing. Right in this room, in early December, I said I was not going to run. New Year's Eve at my youngest daughter's home in California. My wife and my children got me in a bedroom. And that was about the time that things in the country were taking a pretty bad pass. And their argument was, you with your background and the power that you have reached in your party and Washington, we won't let you quit. We need you for ourselves, but we need you for our children. Well, I thought, what the hell, I'll go. Once again, uh, I was then 60, 67 or 8 years old. And that's not too old in that game. So I decided to run, and that was the reason. And my wife helped talk me into it. She swears up and down she didn't. But she did. Uh, are you willing to tell us here you're going to go again in 86? No, no. No, no way. <laughs> OK. I've got a piece of paper and a piece of blood. I'll sign it. No, I, I will be 70. I'll be 70. I just passed my 78th birthday. And not that I think of that as an old man, because I've seen some people in their 30s that I thought were idiots. 
but I just have got a lot of things I want to do right here. How do you think Barry will be remembered around the hill when he's not here? Going to be remembered for a long time to come, I hope. Uh, uh, he's going to be, uh, he is now and will for many years, I, be, I, I think, be thought of as a strong uh, Westerner who made his mark on the country and who understood the real essence of the Senate, which is national in scope, but with a dedicated and particular interest to his own constituency, his own state. I don't know anybody who is, uh, who is prouder of his state and more loyal to his state and its institutions than Barry is. I think he'll remember, be remembered as one of the great senators. And I think he came along at a time when uh, his message was not really appreciated and, uh, but he's planted the seeds that brought the nation back towards the middle. As far as this senator is concerned, uh, he's, he's a fine man. He, I've got nothing to, uh, to be critical of Senator Goldwater, and uh, so I think he'll be remembered by many, many in Arizona whenever he retires as uh, being a fine, fine gentleman. How would you like people to remember your efforts to Arizona, your political efforts, your personal efforts, or whatever? Oh, I think I could say that I'd like to be remembered as an honest man, as one who tried his best. I don't particularly want to be remembered for any particular salient point. I can think of any number of things that I've gotten for this state, but somebody else could have gotten them. I just, like my old uncle that I keep referring to, he'd been determined to be the man of the century in Prescott. He died at 90 years of age, vice president of the Constitutional Convention, mayor of Prescott 27 years, served in the state and territorial legislature, and they say about him, well, he was an honest man. That's about it. <laughs> and that's about it. I'm Bob Richardson. Thank you, and good evening. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. program was sponsored and presented with a minimum of commercial messages by Southwest Savings. Doing things right, that's the Southwest way. Thank you. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue.